Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so it's a it's a three three course. Uh, it, it, we teach it as a three three course, but it's really listed as a two three, which gives us a little bit of license. There will be some Fridays where I'll just cancel class um, because we actually only have to do two hours of lecture a week. But it's really nice to have that extra time uh, to cover the material. And as a result, we will cover uh, we'll cover all uh, ten chapters in in uh, the Roth book. And then we uh, then I'll also uh, put in some extra material as well. And uh, I think you'll you'll benefit from that and the extra material. So I you know so mostly we'll meet on Fridays, but there will be some Fridays where we'll cancel it, uh, just um, just because you know we can. <laughs> so okay, um, so if I share my well first, uh, I'll give you a chance. Any, does anybody have any burning questions they want to ask? Is everybody able to get their um, their uh, um, uh, get their uh, their Nexus board? Yeah, I was able to get it. Okay, I know that there may be uh, there may be some folks who haven't picked them up yet, and I know we're we're, we're we may be a little close on boards because there were eight boards not turned back in the summer. So I don't know. Anyway, we'll we'll see. Uh, I have we have ordered a few more boards. We'll probably get them in about ten days. So if uh, if there's anybody that winds up without a board, you'll uh, hopefully by the second week we'll have one anyway, or the third week I guess. So uh, and just buddy up with somebody to to work on the labs. We'll cut you a little slack and stuff. It's the, remember the first labs really um, you you actually don't you hardly even need the board for the first lab. Uh, in, in every case, the board is the very 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 last thing you do is download the bit file into the board. But it but it's it's important to see it run, so so I don't want to minimize that. But but especially for the first lab, ninety nine percent of the lab uh, has nothing to do with the board until you actually download the bit file at the very end. So you can do almost the entire lab without the board. And so uh, go ahead and uh, even if you even if you don't have a board and we run out of them, which I I don't know, we may have enough. I well, I I I'm having trouble uh, you know keeping up, but my my. The count that's pretty accurate it looks like we're going to be a few short. So anyway, we'll see. Um, okay, Dr. Martin, go ahead. Um, sorry, but the last step of uh, uh, the run, run the tool in patch mode using TCL script um, it looks like something wrong with the uh, with with the with the extension with the file uh, uh, like where it's supposed to be saved and all that because. Uh, yeah. So, so the so from when the Sorry, tutorial was done till now, they have changed the file structure. Okay. So, so it's a little different than it was. Okay. Yeah, I I noticed uh, when yeah. I was doing all this this, but the last one uh, I couldn't figure it out. So. Uh, okay. Well, we'll take a look at it. Uh, okay. If, just uh, catch me in lab on whatever day you're in there. Okay. Yeah, we'll go. We'll take a look at it. Okay. Yeah, I, I off the top of my head, I don't know, but I will tell you the, uh, the they they did change the file structure so that what's printed in the tutorial is a little off, and that may be why you're having trouble with it. But we'll 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 figure it out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No no problem, Amen. Okay. Um, very good. All right. Well, let's so let me share my screen then. Um, and so here here's the here's the syllabus and. Uh, so here it says the pretest. If we bring up the, um, if I bring up the website uh, here, uh, oh, I did, I did put, I did schedule homework. Uh, homework two is all, also scheduled. So you have one and two; those schedules are done now. Um, let's see. No, I didn't want to do that. Uh, what I want to do is back to here. So let me just see. Um, Let's see, I forgot what I was doing here. Um, okay, so we looked at the syllabus. Uh, um, all right, well, yeah, I don't know. Okay, well, anyway, so uh, I there's still a few things if, fix up on blackboard but i'm getting there i think i did uh i did make all the videos let's see let's see if we have the videos um 
Yeah, no, I don't know. Didn't do that. I, yeah, I think they're all right. Well, I don't know. Anyway, okay. So let me just uh, let's just do the let's just jump in the material. I can't remember what I was going to point out in the homework. All right, this is where we left off. We were talking about uh, signals with multiple bits. So these are essentially arrays, and and the way so uh, again. Uh, it's a fair amount of material, but you know, eventually it'll all make sense. Um, so there's, uh, and I'll, I'll, we just have to we have to get a little bit into it before it starts to make sense. But anyway, we have two types of two main types of signals, uh, are actually nets as they call it. Uh, we have wires and we have registers, abbreviated REGs. Wire is a keyword, reg is a keyword, and a wire is just what it sounds like. It connects point A to point B, it has to be driven at one end and the other end, it's driving something. Uh, and if it's not driven, then it's then it's uh, then it, it, it has no value. And it shows up in the, uh, the simulation as a uh, as an X in 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 the simulator world. Uh, these signals can they, they take on one of four values, obviously true or false, which is zeros and one. Uh, or well, one and zero. One is true. Zero is always false. But it can also have uh, a high Z value, where which means it's disconnected. And and if it's not defined and it's not driven, then it shows up as high Z. Uh, if it's driven by a gate whose output is unknown, then it then it can have a value of X uh, or unknown. Uh, when you deal with registers, registers never have a value of high Z. They're either zero, one, or unknown. And that's because a register always contains a value, but if you don't know what the value is, then, you, you, then it has to be an X. And that's, that's true for the simulator. It's not in the real world, obviously, it has a value. You may not know what it is, but there, there is a value. Whereas in the simulator, you have to have something, so it just puts an X. Um, so anyway, uh, so wires and registers. In this case, it's a wire. And we can define arrays for wires or registers, either one. Uh, in this case, the variable's name is B, and we've defined it as uh, four bits numbered from bit three, two, one, zero, working from left to right. Now, you could also do it zero to three, like I said the other day. And normally, we, 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 we normally do it in this order, high to low, because if you look at the constant here, where we're going to assign B four tick binary or four tick B one one zero zero. So the first one's the first high order bit, the next one's the second, the zero is the next, and this last zero will be the low order bit. That's how you read things, and because that's how we read it, that's how we write it. Now, on the other hand, if you're listing elements in say rows in an array, you might very well list them starting with zero because we normally list the first row zero and then one, two, three, going down like that. So especially when we have a, a double dimension array, uh, sometimes we'll number the rows, uh, high order to low order, or we'll, we'll number the variable, the columns essentially, uh, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, um, but the, the, the columns essentially will, will order high to low, left to right, but the rows will order low to high, top to bottom. And we do that by creating a, a second, uh, a, a second uh, parenthesis, a second index essentially. And so if say, let's say we had uh, 10 four bit variables in an array. So we might very well call, call the first index would be three to zero. And that represents the four bit value. And then we'd have a second index zero to say nine. And that would be our 10 rows. But don't get, don't let this confuse you. But we, of course, we always, we always list things uh, row columns, right? So, but when we specify these arrays, it is a little confusing. Anyway, we'll 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 cover when we get to multi-dimensional arrays. We'll cover it. We we'll use them a couple of times in this in in our labs. And remember, uh, single-dimension arrays can be passed uh, in in a port list from one mod. Uh, uh, to a higher level module, but double uh, double dimension um, and triple dimension arrays cannot be. 
and you can have you can have one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions in your array. Okay, so when you do this assign statement this way, it's the same as doing four assign statements, and so that that's obviously saves a lot of time. Maybe not so much with four variables with with a four bit vector, but when you have a thirty two bit or sixty four bit vector. Uh, you don't want to write out 64 assigned statements. All right. And then, of course, this is the, the format for our constants. And you, it, you just have to keep this in mind because um, the constants are always just a little squirrely. OK. We can have an array of AND gates. Looks like this. And uh, so if we wanted to set that up, we, we could list each one like this. Or we could make them all vectors and, and we could set it up this way. And that assumes, of course, that every one of them is set up as a four bit vector. C defined as a four bit vector and uh, A and B. In this case, they can, they can all be, uh, well, so there are a couple of rules that are always true. And so let me tell you one now, and we'll come back and review these many times. So if you don't remember it, that's okay. You will get it eventually. When, when we have assignment statements, the left-hand side, in this case, that would be the variable C, must be a wire. It cannot be a register. Now, the variables on the right side can be wires or registers, doesn't matter. But this variable has to be a wire. And the reason for that is because this is being driven by the output of the AND gates. So it can't be a flip-flop because you can't drive a flip-flop directly it has to have a clock and all that business. And so this, has, this output from this AND gate has to be a wire. And anytime you have an assigned statement, the, the output is essentially coming out of gates. So we always have, so, so whenever you write an assignment statement, the left-hand side has to be a wire. Now, when these statements appear in a, uh, in a process block, which we'll call which there's two of them. We have an initial block and we have an always block. Those are our two process blocks. If it's, if it's in, and we basically use initial blocks in our, in, in, for simulation purposes primarily. Although with an FPGA, because you do get to initialize it with a bit file, you can also use initial blocks in your actual code and they will synthesize. But in, if you're making an integrated circuit, you can't do that because the integrated circuit powers up in whatever condition it wants to. And unless you provide special power-up circuitry to force things into certain uh, uh, states, uh, you won't know what state it's in, so you can't initialize it without doing a whole bunch more circuitry. But in an FPGA, you can because you get to program a bit file. So, uh, so you can use initial blocks when you're programming an FPGA. You can't use them when you're making an integrated circuit in your actual code but we do use them all the time in our test benches for simulating our code, whether it's for a chip or whether it's for an FPGA. Okay, inside one of those process blocks, either the initial block or the always block, it's just the opposite. Your, your statements in there, which we do, don't call assigned statements. We, we, just, we just put C equals A and B, or sometimes we'll use uh, a, a, a different, a construct here for the equal sign. We'll use a less than equal. But anyway, the left-hand side must be a register in that case. So in an, in an assignment statement, left-hand side has to be a wire. Inside an always block or an initial block, the left-hand side has to be a register. And just to keep things even more confusing, when we use an always block in its bastardized way to make uh, combinational logic where we don't intend a clock and we don't intend it to be uh, a process block at all. We're just using it as a shorthand notation. The left-hand side still has to be defined as a register, but when it's actually synthesized, it won't be synthesized as a register. The synthesizer is smart enough to look at your bastardized use of the always block and convert it essentially to regular assignment statements, which seems crazy, but that's, but that's just how Verilog is. It's crazy. Uh, okay. And that's why it's, it's a little bit difficult to learn, especially if, if somebody doesn't spoon feed you the first few bites, uh, it, you'll really choke for the first, uh, for, for a little while. All right, maybe you feel like you're choking now. 
So why must this bitwise and be used with vectors? OK, remember when we had uh, up here, we're using the logical and statement. And here we're using the bitwise and statement. Why, why is that? That's this question. And the answer is, with a single bit, the logical and the bitwise have exactly the same effect, which is why I, I don't like this notation. I would use the bitwise here as well. I don't know why this is popular, but apparently it's popular and that's what people tend to do. But if you, if you have assigned them as vectors and you want them to be bitwise or anded, which would typically be, if this is the, the, the hardware you're looking for, four AND gates, with each having two inputs, A and B, generating these four outputs, this is what you want. You want this to be bitwise. If, if that weren't the case, then this would turn into just one big AND gate. Uh, and it would, test all, it would test the vector A. If any of the bits were, were non-zero, then, then it would be logically true. And then you test vector V, vector B. And if any of the bits were non-zero, then it would also be logically true. And when you logically anded them, then you would get true. But if if either of the vectors were completely zero, then it, then the logical anding result would be false anded with true, which would give you a false result. So um, so this is uh, so so. Always keep in mind, uh, most of the time in Verilog, when we're writing code, because we're actually making hardware, we normally want to do the bitwise operation. But occasionally, we, we want to do the logical operation. So, so I just encourage you, go ahead and use the bitwise and for everything, unless you specifically want to do a logical landing. All right. So general structure of Verilog modules. OK, so Verilog is made up. The whole uh, your what even something like um, you know a big Intel chip, which is made with Verilog files, it it re, it comes down to uh, one big top level module, and that top level module has within it a whole bunch of sub modules instantiated, and many of them have many many sub modules instantiated, and many of those would have many sub modules instantiated. But it, in the end, it's just a bunch of instantiation of modules into uh, working its way up hierarchically into a top level module. So there's one top level module and everything else uh, is underneath that, either instantiated in the top level module specifically or appearing in a module in, in some sub module down the line. Every module has the same structure. In, 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 in VHDL, remember we had, a, we had a, a, an entity and an architecture, but we don't do that in Verilog. We, a module is just one thing. You don't have two different uh, descriptions, one for the port list and then one for the rest of the module. In Verilog, it's all combined, which is simpler in some ways conceptually, I think. So we start every module in Verilog with a port list. And as you might expect, this port list can appear in a number of different ways. There, there are several different ways to write it, which is also confusing. Um, and and we'll, we'll go over a couple of different ways. I'm not gonna do that today because I just don't wanna add confusion. But once you kind of see the several different ways you can actually write the port list in, at the beginning, then you should adopt one way and always do it the same. Um, and that'll kind of keep you out of trouble. So one way to do it is to have the module keyword followed by your unique module name. And, and then that's followed by uh, a list of the signals in parenthesis. And then after that, you go through and you list all the signals again, and you specify whether they're inputs, outputs, are bidirectional with the word in out, and you also specify whether they're whether they're uh, registers or whether they're wires, and whether they're vectors or whether they're single bits. Now you can put all that in the initial list, or, or you can also just skip this initial list and put all this basically uh, line by line 
essentially within the parentheses and specify it all at once. But but the, the, the approach I prefer is you list the signals in parentheses and then you you list all the various specifics of each of each of the variables, whether it's a vector, whether it's an input, whether it's a register or a, a wire. And I think that makes sense. And then once you're once you're done with that, then uh, then you're ready to list any internal signals that you're going to have that you're going to use inside the module, but that, that are not going to appear to the outside world. Remember the port list contains or this interface port or port list, whatever. These, these, are the, these are the signals that come from the outside world into the module and from inside the module to the outside world or bi-directional signals. But, but these, are, these are the only things that appear to the outside world. You may have lots and lots of internal signals that never, never appear to the outside world. And those then you typically, the ones that are used within this module are then listed next and specified as vectors with the designation of either wire or register, or maybe they're single bits or whatever. And then once you get that done, then, then you basically write the contents of the module. And when you finish the, the, uh, the contents, this functional specification of the module, then you have the final statement is an end module statement. So you begin with a module keyword, the module name, the list of variables, and then, and then you do a list of, uh, how each of the variables is actually defined. These are the variables that appear to the outside world. Then you list any internal variables that you need. And then you list uh, all the statements that are going to be uh, make up the module. And then you put the final keyword and module. And that's, that's the context of a module. You are not allowed to define another module inside uh, a module. So inside this module definition, the only th you can instantiate lots and lots of other modules, but you can't define them. You can't create them. So generally in your code, you start with the top level module. And then underneath that, you have your first sub module and your next sub module and you keep going and you, until you've defined everything. Within each of the modules, you may have instantiated all sorts of various sub modules. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a module with two gates. Here's what the hardware looks like. A and B going into an AND gate, the output C going into an OR gate and another variable D going into the OR gate directly and the final output D, uh, E. All right, so, so this, this module, the keyword is module here. That tells the, that tells the, 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 um, the synthesizer that we're gonna describe a module. And then we give it the name no spaces are allowed in the name. So in this case, two underscore gates. That's the name of the module. And then we have, we have uh, signals A, B, A, B, D, and E. Uh, and then here we define them. Now, if we, do, again, in, in, in VHDL, you have to specifically specify. But in Verilog, if you don't specify whether it's a register or a wire, then it, it makes the assumption for you. What, what do you think it assumes if you don't specify? Anybody want to guess? That it's a wire oh, register. It's a wire. Oh. It's a wire. If you don't specify, it's a wire. And if you don't specify a vector, it's a bit. Okay, so in this case, we have a keyword output and E is an output since we didn't specify. It's a wire and it's a single bit. And then for our inputs, we have A, B, and D. There are also wires and single bits. And then we have an internal signal, C, where we specified a wire. I think you have to put it here, um, but yeah. And then we have two assigned statements. Again, the assigned keyword is optional. Don't have to put that. Uh, C equals A, logically ended with B. Well, for a single bit, it's the same as a bitwise ending. So I would recommend using the bitwise operator and not not the double. Same with here. Use the single bar and not the double. So C equals A ended with B. B equals C ended with D. And then these are called concurrent statements or continuous assignment statements is another term we use um, or just assignment statements. These are not procedural. These are not a part of a sequential 
module. These are just a combinational, uh, they're combinational logic where whenever A or B changes, no matter where you where this appears in the module, uh, anytime A or B changes, this will execute. Anytime C or D changes, this will execute. So obviously if A or B change and it changes C, you're gonna also execute this and change E. Well, if it changes. So in any event, uh, anytime the right side changes, these execute, doesn't matter. You can put, you don't have to put this one first and this one second. You could put them the other way around. Doesn't matter. And uh, if D changed, it would this would execute. And if B changed, this would execute. And if it changed C, this would execute again. As soon as that happened. All right. Now, this is the internal signal wire. That's C. So notice C does not appear in the external port list. It's only an internal signal connecting this AND gate to this OR gate. Right here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Martin? Yes. Does the order of input and output matter when you it, write it down? It up here in the port list, you mean? Uh, right underneath the two statement. Yes, those two. It, Does it matter if, uh, if, uh, if you put like input first and output second? No. The only time that comes into play uh, is when you instantiate this module, you have two choices. You can either follow this exact position order when you instantiate it. So remember when you instantiate this module, say in a, in a top level module or whatever, you can shoot, you, you put different variables here. You wouldn't use the same exact variables because the variables you put when you instantiate it are variables relevant to the module you're instantiating it in. This just defines the signals for, the, for, for use inside this module. And when you put, your unique signals in, say, from that type level module in this instantiation, you have to follow this exact order, or you have to use what's called the dot notation, which we'll cover later on. If you want, to, if you don't want to put them in order, or if you're afraid you're going to screw up the order, you can use the dot notation. But otherwise, you have to follow the order, and you can't leave anything blank. So if you have to have, if you're, if you don't care about B, then you have to make a dummy signal. Uh, and put it in this place just because there has to be a signal there. There can't be a blank spot when you instantiate it. The order in which these occur doesn't matter. Now, uh, the one exception for that would be the user-defined primitive. In user-defined primitives, the outputs always have to be first. But we're never going to we're you're never going to do user-defined primitives until you 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 become a Verilog expert. So don't worry about that. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yes, I have a quick one. Uh, just to clarify my understanding, if the uh, Y or C statement, could we just list that uh, C comma E in the output instead? Put, put C up here in the output? Yes. Yeah, it would have to also appear up here if you did that in okay. the parentheses. And Thank then you. this signal would be available to the outside world, which you might not want. Because if you think about it, the problem is you have A and B driving C, but then if you also specify C coming in from the outside, now you have now you're now you have the potential for A and B to make C zero, but the outside world could cause C to be one. And now you have a logical impossibility. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. So you 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 would never want to do that. That's and and here's the sad thing. It might let you. It might let you write that and be perfectly happy. And and then when you got your code synthesized and it didn't work right, you would have no idea why. Now, most of the time, the better, the better synthesizers will give you an error and tell you that, uh, that, that you're creating some kind of multi-port wire that's not allowed. So it'll, it, it'll usually tell you that you did something wrong, but the, the error may not be very comprehensible. But yeah, that's a great example of how you can really screw things up in very long. I have a question, sir. So that, does that mean you can have... Uh only one output of each model, but you can have uh, many inputs. No, you or can, modules can have many outputs in one input or many outputs. I guess it could have many outputs and no inputs. Okay, um, so why, why did you say uh, the outside could cause C to change if it's an output? Well, uh, no, no, no. If, if in, the, in, in this, if, if, if you put C here, if, if you put C instead of here, you put it up here with E, 
and defined it as an output. Then it would appear in the port list. And then when you instantiate this module, uh, in theory, uh, well, okay, I, I guess you could argue that it could that that you wouldn't be able to drive it as an input from your when you instantiate the module. Um, it's it's just that you 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 don't want to have C appear to the outside world is the is really the point. But I guess if you wanted to be able to pick off C so you could look at it for some reason, then you then you could actually put it in there and you could put it up here. So you could have output C comma E and you could have C up here. Yes, you could do that. Uh, I guess I wouldn't be as bad as I was thinking. Uh, but if you made it say an in out a bi-directional signal, then you could definitely get in trouble with that. I have a quick question. Are we able to define the inputs and outputs in the parentheses? No, so the, these, these are signals. So the outputs are defined by the module because you're generating that. So in this case, you're, you're creating E as the output of your module. But, but you don't get this, you don't get to, you don't get to define A, B, and D because that's what comes to you from a top level module, from a higher level module that where you've instantiated this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a little, think of this as a function, okay? Imagine this is a function in C where you, where you have, uh, where you, where you're passing A, B, and D and you're returning E. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what happens whenever you have multiple outputs though? Like, is the return different? Does it return all the outputs or how does that work? Well, say, say particular, say in this case, we could make all of these 32-bit uh, vectors. Sure. So you could put in 32 bits of A, 32 bits of B, 32 bits of D, and you could get 32 bits of E out. And you would have 32 of these gate pairs. So to, the only way to get the return wouldn't be to be like this, this input equals this, or this output equals this module. You'd have to do in another module, you'd have to do, after you instantiate it, you'd have to do like the specific E with the specific bit order, unless it was a 32-bit vector. Sort of. So, so the whole idea would be, let's say you wanted, you wanted to have an AND gate uh, going into uh, to A and B going into an AND gate into an out uh, to an OR gate and D going into the OR gate and you get E back, then you would just instantiate this in your code rather than have to recreate this. Okay. So you just say two gates uh, and you'd specify, you might have like, uh, instead of these letters, you, you'd have different names for the signals. And, and so this gives you something you can use. It's, Obviously, it's hard to think, well, why would you do this? Well, you, you probably wouldn't create a module just for something this simple. But, but for something, say, maybe, maybe it's like a 64-bit a, a adder, you know, where you add A and B and you get, and you get uh, you know, 64 bits of A with 64 bits of B generate a 64-bit sum. Now, that might be useful to have, so you would instantiate that. And, and in this case, you might have 64 bits of W and 64 bits of... Uh, Y and get 64 bits of Z back or something. Okay. okay. All you. right, it's a little confusing. That's why we do the labs because it, it becomes clear when you actually make something work. Okay, so we normally have this black box view of a module. In this case, you'd have the three inputs and the one output. And the, the program that's using this module sort of doesn't care what's in this box. It, it, it knows it it's puts this in and the box is going to do what it what it's designed to do which in this case is this function here and it's going to generate e but as far as the top level module is concerned it 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 doesn't want to look into the box it just wants it wants these signals to come in this signal to come out and it it wants it to process it the way it's been defined but it's not going to pay any attention or check any of this it's just going to assume this is going to be right And that that way you that that way you're you're essentially hiding this you're hiding the complexity of this whatever this is from your top level module because you don't want to have to mess with it you just want to put the signals in and get the signal out you you're expecting. Okay, um, all right. So 
when we specify the, the mode here, output, input, there are three. In can only be an input, out can only be an output, and in out can be both. So now this comes into, this becomes problematic when we have, well, when we have, uh, when a signal could be either one. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a, in a minute. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it on Monday, actually. So here's our program structure. We have a top level module, and then we have additional modules instantiated within that. And each of these would have additional modules instantiated in various hierarchical ways. And some of those would have modules instantiated in them. And so that's how you build up your system. So here's a, here's, here's a one bit full adder, okay? One bit of X, one bit of Y, carry in, carry out, and a sum. So it looks like this, those are the equations that define it. These are exclusive ORs. Uh, there's other ways to define it, but that's one way. And so here's our module, full adder, X, Y, carry in, carry out, sum, output, carry out, and sum, input, X, Y, and carry in. And then here's the guts of the module. In this case, there aren't any internal signals, so we didn't specify any. And then end module. There's no clock, there's no procedural blocks, no always blocks, uh, just two continuous assignment statements, each with a 10 nanosecond propagation delay, or we call it inertial delay. Okay, now let's say we want to do a four bit adder and we want to use, we want to use four of these full adders to make it. So we, we daisy chain these together. This is gonna be a ripple carry adder. And we have a carry in, four bits of A and B and four bits of sum and a carry out. So we have, uh, we have four, eight, uh, nine, in, nine signals in and four, five signals out. But we have these internal signals that would not appear to the outside world. So when we define, when we actually instantiate this into our, uh, our higher level module, we're, we're gonna have some internal signals that we wouldn't put in that port list. And then we're gonna instantiate that higher level module into another higher level module to be used to make it effectively a four bit adder. So here's our four bit adder. It's also a module in its own right. And therefore it can be instantiated in some higher level module to add four bits. Now, the nice thing is you don't have to you don't have to do all this work because you can just say A equals B plus C or S equals B plus C plus carry in. Or you could say uh, actually carry out uh, um, uh, appended with four bits of carry in equals uh, four bits of A plus four bits of B plus a carry in bit. So you, you can actually write it just as one line and not go through all this work. But sometimes you want to specify some of the details. Uh, maybe you don't want to ripple carry at, or maybe you want to carry propagate at, or okay, now you, now you might have to specify this to uh, force the synthesizer to make what you want. Uh, or the synthesizer might, no matter if you just put uh, S equals A plus B, and they were defined as four-bit vectors, it might just automatically make a carry propagate at. Or, uh, Anyway, in this particular case, we're going to do it the hard way. So, so we're going to we're going to take our our one bit adder down here called full adder. Each one of these is going to get a unique name. We're going to instantiate it one, two, three, four times, and uh, and then the results of this, uh, we're going to get the inputs from from this port list here, where A and B and sum are uh, four bit vectors, sum is an output, A and B are inputs, carry in is a single bit input and carry out is a single bit output. And then we generate these, these four or these three internal uh, carry signals. We didn't, have, we, we do three to one. So here there's no zero. Uh, and that's because our zero carry in is up here in our, in our main port list, which by the CI. So, in our first instantiation, where we're going to take A0 plus B0 plus the carry in, the, the bit up here, and we're going to generate a carry out, which is one of our internal signals, this one right here, and the sum zero bit. And then here we're going to have A1, B1. Our carry in is going to be this carry out from here. 
and we're going to get a new carry out, which is C2, and we're going to generate the sum one bit. And then here we're going to same thing. We'll do a we'll this carry out here becomes the carry in here. We have a new carry out C3, and we have a sum two bit. And then finally, our carry out here becomes a carry in here. So the so the this is the carry out here becomes a carry in here. And our final carry out is the carry out up here in our external port list. And then we have a sum three. So what so we can now instantiate this someplace and get a four bit adder function. But fortunately, we don't have to do all that detail work. We can work at a much higher level and just write uh, just write basically uh, we can make sum a five bit vector, which includes the carry out as the higher order bit. And, uh, and, and we can just have sum equals uh, A plus B plus carry in, and we're done. All this, all this is done automatically. So in this case, notice when we instantiated this full adder, our full adder was defined as X, Y, carry in, carry out sum. We followed exactly this order. We had X was A zero, Y was B zero, C in was C sub I, C out was, uh, in this case, was the internal signal C1 right here, C1. And our S0 was the sum. So notice we use different variable names, but we follow the exact order from our module definition back uh, here. This is how we defined it, X, Y, carry in, carry out, sum. OK, I'm going to stop with that, So because uh, I probably got 50 students waiting to get their Viva board parts so they can solder it up. And uh, we'll see you guys on Monday. And um, uh, I don't know if we have questions. I need to go. Uh, so, uh, but real quick, I yeah. did have a question. Um, do the lab demos have a due date? Um, I'd like, I, we'll cut you a little slack the first few weeks till everybody kind of gets rolling. Uh, so it's not critical. Uh, there will be a cutoff date, you know, near the end of the semester. And after that, you, can, you can't demo any more labs. But that'll be like the, like probably right before Thanksgiving. So as okay, long as you do it by Thanksgiving, you're okay. But don't don't wait. Get them done ahead of time because otherwise you'll, you know, you'll get behind and then you won't catch up. And his preferred preference was um, submitting them by like a YouTube link if we could upload on like YouTube, or so, submitting so, them in the in the lab folder. You, you, the easiest way is just to demo it in person in the lab. But if you want, you can do the video. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, we'll see you guys on Monday.